not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love and the cross. Hey Foothills, Pastor Steve here. I am so glad that you can join us this morning as we gather online for our service. You know, I believe that Jesus has something for us today. Uh, something to do in us and something to do th through us. And so I just want to encourage you as we get going with our service to ask God, what does God have for you today? Why don't you take a quick moment, text somebody, say hello. Good morning. You know, the scripture records that they came to Jesus and they said, Teacher, what is the greatest command? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the greatest command. And he said, The second is like it, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And these two is all the law and the prophets. Let's worship together. Save me this time. And 
in my heart of finding you for him to be my savior that he will leave his place on high and come to sin My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always of me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God, is always going to be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God, is always going to be. Yes, living, dying, let me be. Strength, my soul is from this That he who lives to be my king once died to be my savior. That he will leave his place on high and come for sinful men to die. You count his dreams so once day. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there. kids, it's Anna here. Have you ever needed rescuing? Maybe you were up high on a playset and you needed your dad to come grab you and pull you down, or maybe you broke a bone and you needed to go to the doctor and get a cast. Sometimes my kids get hurt with a cut on their finger and just need a band-aid. We all need rescuing sometimes, don't we? And you know, there's a lot of stories about superheroes who rescue people. And oh my goodness, look who we have here today. 
Hi everyone, you may know about me. I'm Miles Morales from the Spider-Verse movie. I'm a kid who rescues people. Just kidding, I'm not a real superhero. But the true rescuer is Jesus, he is real. That's right, and we have been learning about Jesus. In fact, our big picture question is why did Jesus become a human? And Jesus became a human to rescue sinners. And today we're going to learn about the story where Jesus calls his followers. He goes to them and he says, follow me. And you know what? They do. They leave their homes, they leave their jobs, and they follow Jesus. You're going to want to check out the email that your parents are going to get. It has a video link with the Bible story in it. And you can learn all about how Jesus calls his followers and they follow him. Miles, could you help me read the Bible verse for today? He must become greater. I must become less. John 3.30. That's right. Okay, guys, make sure that you check out that email and watch the Bible story. Talk with your parents about what it looks like to follow Jesus. He's our true rescuer. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Foothills. I'm Ed Arnhold on the Elder Board, and I wanted to give a quick update and message. As we live through the coronavirus pandemic, I'm reminded that God is in control. We are at a point when some of the rules may be changing, addressing how we move about and meet. However, it looks like social distancing may be with us through the summer. I know we all look forward to gathering together to worship soon, but our facility does not allow us to meet as an entire church and still maintain six feet of separation. So as the situation changes, we are forming a regathering committee to monitor state and health department guidelines and to provide recommendations of how best we navigate these changing waters. Going forward, we will communicate the path the board recommends for Foothills Community Church. I miss you all and look forward to the day we can all meet together. Please join me in prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your love and care for us, and we're thankful to know and trust in the fact that you're in control. We just lift up uh, the body of believers here at Foothills uh, to open our hearts to what you'll have each of us learn as we go through these uh, unique times. We have uh, needs in the body, and we just pray for the health over our body and uh, that people will remain healthy through this time. We think and are thankful for uh, Faye Krenkel and some uh, good response to the treatments she's going through. And we lift up Kevin Pace and uh, pray, pray for his ongoing uh, healing process and treatment. And we just pray that they'll both be restored fully to you. We thank you for the unknown needs that are in the body, but you know what they are, Father. And uh, we just lift them up today for your prayer and comfort, for comfort for them so that they can uh, know that your loving hand is around them each and every step. We're thankful for the gifts and tithes and offerings that support your ministry here at Foothills until we meet again. Father, uh, we're a needy people, but show us the way and lead us the path each and every day uh, as we look forward to ways to better serve you and reach our fellow uh, servants. We pray all these things in Christ's strong name. Amen. Hey, Foothills. I'm looking forward to jumping into Matthew 5 with you, but two quick things. Last week, I made a comment about my hair getting long in the 60s. I wasn't here in the 60s, so that was facetious, just so you know. Secondly, today, as we jump in, I, I want you to know we're going to deal with some difficult words of Jesus. It's going to start depressing. It's then going to get worse. And then it'll get better, okay? So hang tough. Uh, I sat with a couple years ago and listened to their story. And as they poured out their hearts, uh, as they poured out their tears, their story, their marriage was a story of hurt. There was many wounds. There, they had many times they had tried to push through and persevere and now, as they sat with me, they were so weary, they just wanted to give up, call it quits, be done. They had no more heart energy to give to one another. Honestly, the heaviness of the moment hung in the air. There wasn't anything to say. They admitted their marriage was broken, but they knew that their broken marriage was actually a symptom of something much deeper. They were broken. So how does God make broken things whole? If you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew 5. Now, as you know, uh, we've been in a series in Matthew. Some of you may be just joining us. We've been going through the book, uh, the biography, you might say, of Matthew. And Matthew has three main goals. He wants to show that Jesus is the Messiah, the King. He wants to show that Jesus is a new and better Moses. So just as Moses taught the people of Israel God's instructions, God's teaching, now Jesus is the very teacher from God to his people. And then uh, Matthew wants to show us that Jesus is Emmanuel. He's not just a good teacher, and he's not just an earthly king. He is very God made in flesh, come to be with us. Um, so Jesus in Matthew 5 says that he didn't abolish the Old Testament. He's come to complete it, to fulfill it. And, and he is telling us we're going through the Sermon on the Mount or Jesus' discourse on discipleship in which he shows us what it looks like to live in Jesus' kingdom. Now last week we dealt with two difficult topics, anger and lust. And these were from popular first century interpretations of the sixth and seventh commandment from Exodus 20. Now Jesus dives into an issue that isn't in those Ten Commandments directly, uh, but he takes on a topic that affects every people in every age. And so I just want to jump straight in with you. This is Matthew 5, verse 31. Jesus says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. 
And, and many of us are thinking uh, this is an incredibly condensed passage, just two verses, and we think, Jesus, really, did you go there? You, you went to divorce. This is ubiquitous in our world. Well, it was in the first century also. Um, in fact, remember, Jesus is not dealing simply with what the Old Testament says. This quote is from Deuteronomy 24, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But he, he's actually dealing with the uh, casuistry or the case law that had developed as an interpretation from Deuteronomy 24. So Jesus is saying, um, uh, the rabbis are teaching these interpretations of the scriptures, but I want to give you an authoritative statement. So what were the rabbis saying? They were saying that Deuteronomy was saying, when you divorce someone, make sure you'd give a certificate. Like they were clarifying a procedural error. So when you do it, Make sure you give her a certificate. Cross your I's, dot your T's. In fact, there was a whole legal system that had developed around when you could or, or could not uh, divorce the person you were married to. Now, in Deuteronomy 24, there's this phrase. It says, when she finds no or if she finds no favor in his eyes. It's a very difficult Hebrew expression. And so one of the rabbis, Beit Hillel, says this phrase means that you need some justification, but the justification for divorce can be anything. He gives an example. He says, if she burns his food. Rabbi Akiva disagrees with Beit Hillel and says, even if he finds someone else more beautiful, he can divorce her. This was the debate going on in the first century. Jesus takes this entire debate and he just cuts through it. In fact, he goes behind it. He says divorce, this whole debate, is not about procedural issues. This is not about when to do it. This is not about what to do when you do it. This is not about who you can do it to. Uh, Did you see verse 32? Let's read it again. Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. Whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. What is Jesus saying? Well, Jesus has an expanded teaching on divorce in Matthew 19. You can go read it later. But in Matthew 19, Jesus gives the basis for marriage. He says the two become one. What God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, I understand as soon as we bring up the topic of divorce, it's an incredibly sensitive issue. And there's there's so many variables and so many situations, and we can't engage all those situations here. What I want you to do, or what I want to do this morning, is to help you see what Jesus is saying. Now, some of you just listen, you hear the word divorce, and you say, that's me. I'm in that boat. And then some of you say, that would never be me, and you take pride in that fact. Now, we're not going to do a full study of what the Bible teaches across the whole Bible on divorce, but you can check out Matthew 19, you can check out 1 Corinthians 7, But the question here is, what is Jesus saying here? He's saying something about marriage. He's saying something about God and God's kingdom. Now, just one note. As we read these verses, it says, I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife. So he's clearly talking about the men, um, as if all the power is in the hands of the men. And in the first century, that unfortunately was very often the case. But what's happening is the men were attempting to escape responsibility because they were saying, look, I did a certificate. I did what the rabbis said. Jesus is cutting through that and he's placing responsibility on the man, thereby giving dignity to the women. What what he's saying is, don't divorce. Uphold your commitment before God. In fact, marriage is more than a contract, more than just a verbal commitment. It is a covenant. 
That's what he's saying about marriage. Marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a reflection of God. God is perfect all the way down. That is, God is whole. Remember that phrase from chapter 5, verse 48? You, therefore, must be teleos, must be perfect or whole, as God is whole, as he's perfect. So marriage is a covenant that's meant to reflect God. God is whole. Therefore, marriage is not to be divided. You see, that is the issue that Jesus is getting at with divorce. A divorce is a division. But, but how can you divide the very image, the very picture that God has placed to reflect him? And so Jesus sets this high standard and says, I insist on integrity or wholeness in marriage because it reflects the very God who makes and keeps covenants. That's the principle that Jesus is teaching. God is perfect and whole. God makes and keeps covenants, so marriages need to make and keep covenants. Now, but the truth is, you know, society and our culture, divorce is ubiquitous. In the church, it's the same way. What has gone wrong? Part of the problem is that we view marriage upside down. We think, uh, really deep down, that we think we will stay married because we love each other. But the biblical view is in many ways different than that. Um, That is, we love one another because we're married. You see, it's not just that we're married because we love. We are supposed to love because we're married. That means we're in a covenant relationship to our spouse. Now let's take a moment and just look at Deuteronomy 24. You don't need to turn there, but this is uh, what Deuteronomy 24 does not say. Deuteronomy 24 does not say when you divorce or do it with a certificate. What Deuteronomy 24 does say is that if someone does divorce, then it needs to be official with a certificate, and then she remarries someone else, and then that person divorces her, she isn't able to remarry the first person. The law was intended to protect human lives so that marriages weren't starting and breaking up all the time over non-issues. In fact, in Deuteronomy 24, it is clear that the Israelites were trying to divorce whimsically, and so God was dealing with something called hardness of heart. They had a hard heart. That's exactly what Matthew 19 says. He says, Moses allowed you, he gave permission for you to divorce in, in the, uh, because of your sclerocardia your hard heart. Jesus clarifies what is the allowable hard-heartedness. He says it in verse 32, except on the ground of sexual immorality. Some of your translations might say adultery. The Greek word is porneia. It means sexual immorality of any kind. Now, in Deuteronomy 24, The allowance is phrased differently. It's said to be the unclean thing. Jesus tells us what that unclean thing is. It's sexual immorality. So the principle of marriage is covenantal wholeness that reflects God. The problem in marriage is the unclean thing. That is, it's not just marriages that are broken up, it's broken people who get married in the first place because the truth is you and I, in one way or another, all wrestle with the unclean thing. We are all broken. So you can be single and broken. You can be married and broken. You can be remarried and broken. You can be divorced and broken. Why are we unclean? Well, it's because of sclerocardia, hardness of heart. So in Deuteronomy 24, it was hardness of heart. Matthew 5, it was hardness of heart. Matthew 19, it was hardness of heart. 
Think of your heart like it's brittle. It, it is, it is, uh, um, it, it's been solidified. And so it, two brittle things run into each other in marriage, and then they chip, and they break. But if you and I are all hard-hearted, if we were all unclean in some way, if we're all broken, then we bring that into everything we do. I want to call this the spirit of divorce. Listen to what the spirit of divorce sounds like. It's the the phrase that might rattle around in your mind or your soul that says, I'm better off on my own. I'll take care of myself. See, you can be single and say that. You can be married and say that. Uh, It's the spirit of divorce fantasizes over autonomy. What I want, what I really, really want is to be on my own, away from you. I I would like to be, in fact, um, uh, having fun myself, pleasing myself on a beach by myself. You see, that's a, it's a fantasy that, that we're autonomous, that we don't need, don't want, don't have any other people in our life. We aren't dependent on anyone. Or it's the, the accusations that go on, meaning my life would be good, my marriage would be good, my relationships would be good. I could experience some of the wholeness that I see God talking about, except that it's his fault or except that it's her fault that I'm not. So there's a massive tension here in Jesus' teaching. The tension is this. He raises the bar so high, he says, don't do it. Don't get divorced. And and then he gives allowance for this sexual immorality. I want to give one more note to that in just a moment. But he says, don't do it. Divorce defaces God's image. So the standard is hugely high. And, And the truth is, the higher we raise the standard the more we realize we all slam into the standard. None of us lives up. None of us perfectly reflects the wholeness of God. None of our marriages are healthy enough. None of our hearts are soft enough. In one way or another, we have all experienced some kind of relational trauma, and the truth is we have all done some kind of trauma. Now, trauma is a strong word, and some of you are saying, I lived it. I lived it, and I got out. And some of you are saying, I I haven't really experienced the same kind of trauma as someone else. And, And that's true. That's real. We all come from different experiences, and we all respond differently. But we all have experienced relational brokenness. Now, I just want you to see in here that Jesus, he's talking about the non-allowable divorces. What, what he's saying is, whoever divorces his wife without this exception, you, know, you see he gives the exception for sexual immorality, he's talking about that first century interpretation. Whoever divorces his wife because of burned food, Whoever divorces his wife because he found someone else more beautiful. Whoever divorces his wife for any other reason. Then he breaks the covenant, but he, he breaks the covenant inappropriately. The covenant is not broken before God. So then when she remarries, because he's presuming that by divorcing her, he's causing her hardship. So she has to get remarried. By when she gets remarried, then she is committing adultery. That is, she's breaking her covenant to her former husband. You see, that's what Jesus is saying. Whoever is going about this in the non-exception cases. So, I remember I was six or seven, and I was coming back home from a church potluck, and I don't remember the kind of of dish I was carrying, but it was a a white plate. And I walked into the garage, I tripped over the threshold, and the plate sailed out of my hand, and it hit the concrete floor, and it shattered 
into a million pieces all across the floor. And in some ways, our marriages are like that. Some of you, when I say that, you think, well, my marriage isn't. My marriage is really good. Yeah, that's wonderful. But there's brokenness in you. And it bleeds out into your marriage. Some of you say, yeah, I am that. I'm the broken person on the concrete floor. This section of Jesus' teaching starts depressing, and then it gets worse. Look at verse 33. Again, you've heard it said that to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, even by heaven, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, and, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil, or, or some translations might say the evil one. And, and you say, Steve, how can this get any worse than the section on divorce? Jesus is talking about anger, and then he talks about lust, and then he talks about divorce, and now he is talking about oaths. This seems better than all those because I don't make oaths. No problem. Well, I want you to pay attention and listen. He's again dealing with the case law, the casuistry in the first century about when you are bound to do what you say and when you can get out of what you say. And Jesus at the end, he clarifies it. He says, you say yes or no, anything else is evil. So think with me. Jesus is highlighting the same principle as in divorce. He's now highlighting that principle in how we speak and act. It's called integrity. That is, he's highlighting wholeness in marriage, and now he's highlighting wholeness, integrity, in truthfulness. He is saying to say what you mean and do what you say, period. That is, in the covenant of marriage, he's saying, don't break it. Reflect God in your covenant making and keeping. He's saying the same thing with truthfulness. Essentially, he's saying God speaks and then always does what he says. God never breaks his word. God never goes against his word. God never gives us half truth. When you get God, you get truth all the way down. You and I are made in God's image. We are to be like him in our speech and our action. We are to be whole. We are to be integral. We are to commit with our words and then follow through. But in the first century, that's not what was happening. Did you see verse 33? You've heard it said to those of old, you should not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you've sworn. I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Well, why? Well, In Matthew 23, Jesus gives an example. He's talking about the Pharisees and to the Pharisees. And he says, if you swear, he says, the Pharisees say, if you swear by the temple, you don't have to do what you said. But if you swear by the gold of the temple, then you do have to do what you said. In fact, one rabbi says that if you swear by Jerusalem, listen to the words, if you swear by Jerusalem, you don't have to do it. But if you swear toward Jerusalem, you do have to do it. In other words, there was an entire legal system that had developed around how do you get out of doing what you said. And Jesus clearly says truth all the time, no exceptions. Well, why? Uh, He gives these examples, verse 34. He, He says, either by heaven, it's the throne of God, 35, or by earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king, or by your head, for you can't make one hair white or black. Jesus is saying, don't invoke God's presence in order to bolster your words because God's presence is everywhere. He's here. He's, in, he's there. He, he's in heaven. He's in Jerusalem. He's in front of you right now. He is there. God is present. 
And sometimes, if you are living a life to prove to God that you are good, then thinking of God being present with you in the dark places of your life, in the places when nobody's looking, uh, could feel like condemnation because God sees everything. He sees what you think, what you do. Um, But there's also a sense in which Matthew is highlighting God's presence. Jesus is Emmanuel. And at the end of the gospel, Jesus says, Behold, I have all the authority on heaven and on earth, and I am with you always. Well, think about that. Think about if you had the, the vastly majestic and powerful and good God with you all the time. That you could ask, you could talk to, you could get wisdom from. James says, if you lack wisdom, then ask God, for he gives generously to all. So some people who are trying to prove their goodness to God might feel condemnation. But other people, they might enjoy and actually be encouraged and emboldened because God is with them and they can access him anywhere. So there is no need to swear by God because he's already there. The second reason that Jesus is talking about is, remember, he is describing life in the kingdom. Remember Matthew one twenty one. Jesus is to be named Jesus, Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus has come to rescue sinners. He does it by making a covenant with them. That, uh, another word for covenant is vow or oath, just like we talked about a moment ago with a marriage covenant. So if you say yes to Jesus, then you are already in a covenant of complete integrity and truthfulness to God. Since you're already in, uh, you're bound to God by an oath, you might say, you have no need to add extra oaths onto your life. So the principle that Jesus is giving us it is it's not like when you were four and you told your sibling something and behind your back you had your fingers crossed and you said, nanner, 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 ha, 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 I can get out of what I said because my fingers were crossed. Jesus is saying, no, don't do that. Integrity all the way down. Truth, no exceptions. And you say, Steve, I, I don't tell lies. I... I'm not the kind of person that that just uh, makes outright fabrications, and and you might be right. But what about this? Let me give you a small list and see if you can find yourself in here. Uh, What about political lies? I don't mean lies from politicians. I mean lies to make yourself look better. Like this, you forget a meeting, and so you jump into the car And you text and you say, almost there, when you're 20 minutes out. Um, What about embellishing stories? Uh, The fish, of course, was actually, it, it doesn't even fit on this camera. The fish was so big that I caught. But not just fish stories. The way you bend the story is to highlight you in the story and to downplay others. Or, or what about exaggeration? Since we were just talking about um, marriages, what about in marriages when there is conflict, you're upset, and you say, you always do that, or you never do this? Is that true? Always and never are strong words. If you have ever told any human in your life that they always or they never, then you lied, sorry to say. Or, or what about word inflation? Uh, that is, you, you, um, my, my three-year-old, she just had a birthday, she's four now, but she would take a lollipop and say, this is amazing. And then she'd have uh, an ice cream comb and she'd say, this is my favorite. And then she'd eat broccoli and say, oh my word, this is so good. And, and everything she said was to the extreme. 
And so when you're around somebody who uh, inflates words all the time and uses the biggest word they can, then pretty soon in your mind when you hear them, you deflate their words. You think, that's not really true. The, this wasn't the best experience ever. Uh, this isn't the, the most incredible sermon I've ever heard. This isn't the, the best song on the radio right now. Uh, or there's business lies. Um, that is, you say one thing to your employees. Our business is doing great, but in actual fact, you're, the business is really struggling. Or, or there's another kind of lies. I don't know what to call this, but this is where you think to yourself, they won't understand, and so I won't tell them. You see, you and I are doing what they were doing in the first century. We are looking for a way out from truth. We're doing exactly what they did. You probably know the word integrity comes from the math word integer. Whole number, not a fraction. The truth is, you and I are fractions. That is, our integrity is fractured. Every time we tell a half-truth or we allow somebody to believe a half-truth, we destroy human community. If somebody, let's just say, sends you an article and, and you read the first paragraph and then they later say, did you see what I sent you? Did you read it? And you, and you say, yeah, I read it. But you didn't. And then there, the trust between people, between community, is degraded. The more people say things that are untrustworthy, the more we can't trust what people say. It's the very fabric of everything we do, all our, interaction, all our interactions. But if I can't trust you, then we can't have relationship like God intends. Half-truths, lies disintegrity destroys human identity. I, I've sat with people in my office whose lives are so full of half-truths that they say, I don't know who I am. I, I can't sort out wh who I am, who God made me, because all these messages are coming in from the, the, the half-truths I've lived or said or believed. Um, half-truths destroy human dignity. Joy Davidman, in one of her books, says, There are lies of gossip which make haters out of us, the lies of advertising which make money out of us, the lies of politicians who make power out of us. What she's saying is, lies don't just do things to other people, lies do things to the liar. That is, they turn us from human subjects into objects. Every lie demeans, destroys, and violates the dignity of of the person that you're talking to. In essence, you're saying you're not worth the truth. So the truth is, you and I, we are not whole. We don't always do what we should. And we're left with this question in the fractures in our covenant making for marriage, in the fractures in our truth-telling what do we do? Well, one option is just to try harder. To, to, to stick it out in this covenant that you've made and, and to, to grin and bear it, so to speak. But if you've ever tried that, perseverance only lasts so long. We have a finite ability to push through pain. I don't know if you're familiar with the Japanese practice of kintsugi. I only learned about it a couple of years ago, but I want to just describe it very briefly for you. I broke that plate on the garage, but let's take a different image. I want to show you a picture of a, of a, a broken piece of pottery. This is a mug, so check out on the screen. This is a broken mug. Now, broken pieces, you can see it on their screen. Broken pieces can't do anything. They're not really worth anything. You can't sell them. You can't do what was intended, drink out of this mug. They're only really worth 
to be thrown out. And if it is true that we are broken covenant uh, keepers, we, we keep covenants not that well in marriage, and we are broken covenant or commitment makers, that is, we say stuff we don't mean or we don't do what we say, we could feel that way. Like we're just broken. Well, in this practice of kintsugi, the broken pieces are cleaned and then scoured, and then there's a mixture of either gold or silver or platinum put together, uh, uh, and it's painted on the cracks and in between the cracks, and it's pieced back together. And so I want to show you a picture. Here's the same mug that was broken. Here it is back together. Here is the uh, white mug, or it's a bowl. It's put back together. You can see the gold outlines of the cracks. The truth is, you look at these, this mug and this bowl put back together, and, and you see that not only is it put back together, it's useful, but it is, it's beautiful. Well, listen to the words of Jesus. Behold, I make all things new. And he does in the hearts of the willing. There's a term through the New Testament, and the term is gospel, but the word gospel means good news. And here is the example. God looked into your life and into your heart, and he sees that you're broken, that you are a broken covenant maker, that you are a broken committer. That there, your life is fractured. There's pieces uh, and broken promises and empty words, and all these things are a bad reflection on the perfect whole God of the Bible. And so what does God do? Does God throw you away? Does he ignore you? Does he despise you and look down on you? No. No. God sends his own son to live your life and to die your death. To take on your brokenness and like liquid gold to exchange his blood for your brokenness. When you and I, when we bring our brokenness to him, uh, we realize we can't repair ourselves, we can't complete ourselves, we can't hold it together. History, culture, society is proving that very few couples can, can, by their own grit, hold marriage together. But God invented marriage, and God invented commitment. God invented integrity. God invented uh, follow-through. He is perfect. He's perfectly whole, and the perfectly whole God gives himself to you in Jesus. Emmanuel. This is Matthew's theme. So when you and I come to Jesus and we bring our brokenness to him, he takes our pieces and glues them together with his blood and he makes a mosaic that reflects him. I came across this interesting picture. 700 photos were taken and then put together and when the artist put them all together, uh, he shows a, an image of Jesus. So here, check it out. It, you see, this is just an artist's rendering of Jesus. But the point is, the brokenness of all of us brought and surrendered to Jesus is the very beginning of the beauty and the newness that Jesus does that he promised and he always does what he says. Behold, I make all things new. It's incredible and mysterious how God redeems sinful humanity. First Peter says that the, even the angels long to look into these things. Ernest Hemingway said, The world breaks everyone, and afterward many are strong at the broken places. You see, when something broken is repaired, something beautiful is created. And the story of the Bible is stories 
of Abraham's brokenness, Moses' brokenness, Gideon's brokenness, Joseph's brokenness, the whole people of Israel's brokenness, and then even Jesus' brokenness as he was murdered for you and I. But then God raised him from the dead, and he shares that resurrection life with you and I and all those who bring our brokenness to him. So does Jesus in this passage answer every single question about marriage and divorce and remarriage? And the answer is no. And it is a huge topic, and it would take us uh, many weeks to work through the biblical teaching on that. But here, he highlights one thing for marriage and our covenant making, and also for our truth-telling, our speech. He says this, Jesus insists on integrity. The standard is as high as it can be. He insists that his kingdom is a kingdom of covenant making and keeping and a kingdom of truth telling. He insists on integrity. But then we know he'll help you do it in the hearts of the willing when you bring yourself to him. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are, that you um, really emptied heaven in a sense. You gave all of yourself to us. And, and God, we have questions. And as we look at our life, and if we're honest, we're fractured people. And that's why all our activity, all our covenants are fractured as well. And yet, God, I want to ask on behalf of all of us that to invite you into the dark spaces of our life those deep fractures, those places that we know we cannot heal on our own and invite your your cross work, your life and your death and your resurrection to be like our liquid gold. That is, would you meld and mend and weld the pieces of our life back together? Would you help us to become your people made in your image? Would you make all things new. In your name, Jesus. Amen.